welcome to Behind the Ticker. I'm Brad Roth, Chief Investment Officer of Thor Financial Technologies and Portfolio Manager of THLV, the Thor Low Volatility ETF. Behind the Ticker uncovers the inner workings of the ETF industry. We will interview portfolio managers and ETF service providers to dive deep into their work lives and their businesses. We will learn the inner workings of their strategies and what drives them as they continue to grow their company. Many of these individuals are entrepreneurs and will have unique and compelling insights to share as much goes on behind the ticker. Please note, nothing in this show is investment advice, and it is meant solely for educational and entertainment purposes only. Welcome to Behind the Ticker. Today we have Kyle Wiggs. He is the founder of UX Wealth. They are a technology company that helps investment advisory firms put together an efficient tech stack. They also do trading, billing. They also have a very unique set of model portfolio strategies that are made available to their investment advisors. A lot of those strategies utilize technology or artificial intelligence in some way, shape, or form. So Kyle has a very unique perspective from the investment advisory space as to what the best practices are and how advisors are utilizing technology to make their business more efficient, also provide better outcomes for their clients. Additionally, although Kyle is not behind the ticker, he sees a a lot of unique active strategies that are either considering or have already converted to an ETF. So he kind of sees those in their infancy and has a unique perspective on how they make those decisions to get to launch day. So without further ado, Mr. Kyle Wicks. Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brad. So before we get started, uh, can you share with us a little bit about your background and how you eventually decided to start and form UX Wealth? Yeah, happy to. And and thanks for for having me and and UX. So I started my career in the early 2000s um, as an external wholesaler and spent many years just in advisors' offices, um, getting a sense for what was important to them um, and trying to take that information, spent many years on on various leaders' councils. and ultimately, the objective was to try to understand what the advisors were, were in need of and what the firm was providing and close that gap. And then in 2013, I went to a broker-dealer network. We had about 4,000 advisors across the country. And I was responsible for really the platform, technology, um, trading, building, reporting, and distribution. Um, that entity was ultimately sold to LPL in 2017, really at the height of the DOL. Um, and so the idea was to, to take everything that we had heard from the advisor community um, and, and to see if it existed in, in the form that we thought the advisors were asking. Um, and, and our assessment as we looked around sort of the landscape was that it didn't exist. So we did a bunch of due diligence, uh, technology work, and ultimately formed and founded UX Wealth Partners in June of 2020. So before we talk about UX Wealth kind of deeper, what are some of the things I always like to ask everybody that you like to do outside the office? What do you do for fun when you're not working? And I know you work a lot. Um, yeah, so a couple things. Um, love to golf, uh, big, big cyclist. Um, so I try to get a couple of big rides in uh, at least once a year. There's one in Colorado, many people would know, called the Triple Bypass, which goes over three of the uh, Colorado passes. So I'd say those are probably the two primary ones. That's right. You are from Colorado. Why did the Denver Broncos stink this year? The Denver Broncos stink because John Elway was the best and the worst of GMs. So he was the best of GMs because he convinced Peyton Manning to come to Denver. And we got DeMarcus Ware and we got Aqib Tlaib and the list goes on. And they basically masked John Elway's inability uh, to draft (laughs) talent. And so once Peyton left and DeMarcus Ware left and Von Miller left, the, I mean, the, the cupboard was bare. And so we have an incredibly uh, weak uh, team that has no depth, <laughs> really no, no talent. And we just <laughs> traded for Russell Wilson, who's a disaster. So there you have it. I, I didn't mean to, you know, rub salt in the wound this early, but, you know, I had to, I had to poke the bear. Yeah, for, for, for context for those listening, the Broncos just gave up 70 points, and it could have been 100 if my were. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get back to it. Um, UX Wealth. So can you explain really in a little bit more detail what UX does for investment advisors, kind of soup to nuts, and you know, explain 
the technology stack and how it works? Yeah, so um, many would be familiar with what's known as a TAMP or a turnkey asset management platform. So names or household names that, that advisors would probably, particularly in the RIA community, less so on the broker-dealer side, right? So on the BD side, you have your traditional TAMPs, which are asset markets and your SEIs of the world. Um, and, and what's happened in that space over time is that the broker-dealers are really trying to, to move assets away from those TAMPs and get them on their own sort of in-house platform. Um, in the RIA community, the, the names that people would probably be familiar with would be Investnet. You've got Orion. Um, you've got you know, GOL SmartX. And so what we do, um, in addition to sort of those firms, is we do really everything that, that an advisor probably um, has to do but shouldn't do, right? It's the things that they need to outsource to create scale and efficiency and, and equity in their firm. So trading, uh, billing, all reporting. Uh, we build out the advisor dashboard, which is branded and personalized to an advisor's business. Um, the client dashboard, which gives clients access to all their statements and billing files and reports. Um, and then we've got a pretty um, sophisticated trading system that we've built out that uh, pipes to all the various custodians. So we work with uh, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, recently was TD Ameritrade until the merger. Um Interactive Brokers, Apex, Axos, kind of you name it. And so it's the idea that we give access you know, to the, to the investment advisor um, who's just trying to meet with clients, do a great job uh, and grow their business. And then we basically take off their plate, all the back office um, sort of responsibilities that they have. And so from my understanding, kind of just looking at the website, you also provide a pretty differentiated list of available managers on the platform. I mean, it's a unique... Uh, kind of a unique set of managers and, and why why are you curating kind of these types of managers rather than what you might see at a traditional TAMP? So there's enough TAMPs out there. We didn't need another one that, that was kind of a me too. Um, and then all of a sudden you, you, you become the definition of a commodity, right? You're doing the same thing as everybody else. And now we're competing on either relationships or price. Um, when I was in the broker dealer world, <clears throat> many of the BDs, unless they have their own tech stack, use InvestNet. And then they all source the same model managers, not picking on them, but they're all the same. It's, it's the Russells and the Vanguards and the State Streets and the American funds of the world. Um, and so now we have a situation where advisors are all using the same technology, largely. And these are technologies that were built in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and then they're all using the same investments. And, and, and it's no wonder why we have fee compression because we've essentially commoditized our business. And so as we looked at all of the model marketplaces that existed, one of the questions that we had really as a thesis was, why is every other industry, pick one, healthcare, communication, um, you name it, using technology to sort of, not sort of, but to literally break down barriers and, and you know push industries forward, except when it comes to how we invest. The, th the ways that the advisors and, and clients are investing today in an asset management, from an asset management perspective are, are not any different than we were doing in the 70s and 80s and 90s and, and, and so on. And so um, we went out and we started asking a lot of questions of these various platforms, uh, large institutions. And, and really what we found was um, it wasn't that they didn't believe that the technology could do a better job. It was more uh, self-preservation. It was a CIO with a CFA designation who would say, well, that's my job. So they didn't look at the technology as, hey, man, this is something that can make, perhaps make me better at what I do or expand the universe of what we do. And so we couldn't find it. And so we just decided that the hill we were going to die on is we were going to find the best technology-driven investment solutions that provide asset allocation models for clients based on their goals and objectives eliminate the human emotion and bias. And then we sign exclusive deals with most of these managers. Um, and, and so really, Brad, that was the idea behind it was that, you know, I don't know if it's going to be 10, 15 or 20 years, but there will come a day that we look back on investing the way we do it now. I think similarly to, you know, when I first moved to Charlotte in 2006, you could smoke in a restaurant. Okay. My, my kids will never step foot in a restaurant. Uh, where you can smoke. And I think there will come a day where we'll look back and go, remember when humans used to pick stocks and ETFs and mutual funds? Um, we're not there yet, but that's where we're headed. So what is it about these types of managers that 
potentially can provide, you know, a better outcome for clients? Like why, and you briefly touched on it, you know, the human element or the emotional element, but you know, what really is it about some of these, you know, emotion or computer or motionless or computer driven strategies that have the ability to drive better outcomes? So I think the first thing that we have to understand is what specifically is the technology trying to solve for? And that's a question that we um, ask of every one of them. Um, Think of Tesla, Brad, for just a second. You know, Tesla has had challenges with their autonomous driving, largely because the problem of autonomous driving, it's a problem. And and the technology is trying to solve that. And the problem is too big. There's too many variables that, that you can't program into something. Whereas when we meet with a manager, we specifically say, what exact and specific objective are you trying to achieve? And, and I'm going to oversimplify this for a second, but there's kind of two broad categories that we, we can find. One is a category that is looking to minimize volatility, looking to minimize drawdowns in a portfolio. And then the other one is, is pursuing alpha. And so what we have found is that the human component, when the proverbial, you know what, hits the fan, right? Like, I don't care if you're the best money manager in the world. In 2008 or during COVID, like you became emotional just like everybody else. And so your strategy all of a sudden becomes you know, skewed, if you will, by that human emotional component. And so what we look for are strategists who have a very uh, disciplined technology, almost rules-based, that has proven, whether it was 2008, whether it was the fourth quarter of 2018, whether it was during COVID, they have a disciplined, unemotional way of de-risking a portfolio and limiting drawdowns. You're not going to miss all of it. And certainly you give up some of the upside, but it's the idea over a full cycle. If you can keep a client fully invested through the ups and downs, that's where we see the better outcomes. And then on the other side of it, some of these managers are using technology to measure things that humans can't, right? So humans are inherently limited, whereas these technologies can run you know, literally an infinite number of uh, sort of simulations and outcomes on a daily basis. And so maybe a specific example is a technology that we have that looks at sentiment. So it's looking at the 500 names of the S&P 500, and it's measuring in real time everything that's being said about a company in the digital world. So it takes that information on a weekly basis. You think of the volume of info that, that would be required, and it forms an opinion. Is the sentiment about Tesla for this week positive or negative? And then it just ranks and it picks the top 30 names. Humans fundamentally, by the time we do research and analysis and we meet with the investment committee and we vote, like it's already priced into the market, right? So we've missed it. So I think those maybe would be two ways um, specifically that we we look for, you know, various disciplines. Yeah. So with that being said, I mean, you've been in the business for a long time. You've seen kind of the evolution of the way portfolios have been constructed. So in your eyes, like how has model portfolio construction evolved throughout your career and where do you think it's going? Well, that's a good question. <clears throat> I would say that the, the lion's share of the assets in the industry really haven't evolved. Right? So the, 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 the asset allocation logic, you know, using modern portfolio theory as sort of the sing- singular thesis around how we construct portfolios really in a vacuum. That really hasn't changed. The, the allocations that you see today aren't very, you know, they're not dissimilar than something you would have seen 20 years ago. The, the vehicles that we are using, ETFs and, and other products, right? Like the, the access to, to maybe more transparent and more liquid and lower cost vehicles um, is really, I would say, where the asset allocation has evolved. But the allocations itself really hasn't. And so I, where, where I see it going is that um, technology doesn't have an opinion, it, it, sort of a bias, if you will, around you know, growth versus value, U.S. versus international, large cap versus small cap. It simply is trying to determine, is the environment we're in today better suited for a value company or a growth company, a large cap or a small cap, right? A U.S. or an international ETF. And so... It almost in some ways throws the rules out of you've got to have style boxes all checked at a certain percentage at a certain risk tolerance. And it's simply trying to find the most efficient combination of securities within a a given risk tolerance, um, regardless of sort of all the the rules that we've been living by for the past 50 years. 
Yeah. So I'm going to ask the same question, but in a different in a different way. So the RIA space or the investment advisory space, you know, how have you seen the technology evolve uh, or that advisors need to adopt in order to streamline their practice? I mean, at the bare minimum, what do advisors need today to streamline their practice? And and on top of that, not necessarily bare minimum, but what would be in your eyes the best practice? technology stack they would need in order to efficiently run their practice as we kind of enter this technology phase? Well, it's a, that, oh, that's a loaded question. Um, you have the floor. Yes. I'm going to try to, to give you a simple answer um, to a complex question. So it, no advisor is going to get a call from a tech provider that says, hey, my name's Brad Roth and my technology stinks, right? Let me tell you what, it doesn't do well. Everyone says they've got the, the next greatest thing. And Michael Kitsis, he organizes, you know, information in such a way that that, that really doesn't go very far, though, because what, what is so important is how do the technologies on the back end connect and communicate? And, and that's where we spend. We hired a, a gentleman to, to run our technology stack who built um, Circle Black, actually, and we spent a lot of time thinking about sort of the, the friction between two different technologies to, to ensure that data is passed accurately and efficiently. So what do advisors need? The first thing that they need is obviously some sort of a, a centralized dashboard that can process and handle everything from the custodian. Because the custodians are, that, that's not what they do, right? So you get an overnight sync and you have to, you need to send that data somewhere that is very good and accurate at processing the data. Then they need a, a piece of technology that can automate and handle trading. Uh, some advisors may not trade that often and it may not be as important, but as we see a wider adoption of technology driven investments, how you trade is almost as important as the investment itself. So I think that the trading component, the order management piece is going to be really important um, along the lines of the dashboard, giving them a centralized view of their business. Um, it needs to be able to connect with multiple custodians. So, an advisor might be at Schwab, but they might have a prospect that's interactive at interactive brokers. And that client may not want to repaper to come on board with you. So I think eliminating that friction and having a, a centralized hub that, that can connect all the custodians is important. Um, billing. Having somebody run billing accurately, efficiently deliver um, you know, your billing files and statements to the client portals in an automated fashion is one of those necessary evils that doesn't drive revenue for an RIA, but is really, really important. And then beyond that, I think it's, it's having an open interface, a platform that can connect with, you know, one advisor might like Riskalyze, but another one might like OnPoint or uh, Stratify. And so having that flexibility, one advisor might like Wealthbox and someone else might like Red Tape. And so having that ability to really, I think, have more of a hub and spoke model where you don't have to disrupt the way you run your business um, in order to work with whoever your outsource provider is. Um, so I'd yeah. say those would be the, the sort of bare necessities that would be really important. Well, where do you, so what do you think is next then, Kyle? If that's, if that's bare necessities, I mean, do you see... Do you see an all-in-one emerging at all? I mean, where are we? Where do you think we're going in the next, you know, five years? And, and again, this is a loaded question that we don't know the answer to, obviously. But we're having a discussion. Like, when does AI get in the mix with a lot of this stuff? Well, so AI can do two things right now. Again, oversimplifying. There's what you and I are talking about, which is true AI and machine learning that's helping us drive and make better investment decisions. It's not perfect, but you're starting to see like it's getting better, whereas humans are relatively stagnant. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece is that there are firms in our space that are, that are looking to leverage AI to um, automate some of the service aspects of what they do. I think the sort of dirty secret of that is the technologies that were built in the late 90s and early 2000s, not naming names, are not as efficient as the technologies built in the last couple of years. So what they're doing to augment that is use AI to try to help solve for some of the service issues and inefficiencies that their platform actually is creating. So going forward, I, I still I'll, I think you'll see that. I think you'll see an emergence of managers. I think you'll see... Uh, AI as a service hub to automate, 
um, not for all the firms, but for some, um, we have a different opinion on that. We're very behind AI in terms of investments, but not in terms of service. I don't know, Brad, if you've ever picked up the phone and called somebody and you just need an answer and you're talking to a machine and it takes you 10 minutes and you want to you want to throw your phone. I think there's a human component to advice that's really important. I think that clients still want, clients with money still want to talk to a person that they trust and advisors with a good business still want a support team that they can call. So I don't know that I see that. Your other question is related to an all-in-one solution. I think that there's two schools of thought. There are some people that really are drawn to an all-in-one solution. Um, I would argue and push back on an all-in-one solution versus the hub spoke that you and I just talked about forces an advisor to make a really big decision. Like you have to convert your CRM. You have to use their billing. Like there's so many things that you have to sort of say, yeah, and, and maybe you like three-fourths of what they do. And what happens if five years from now, some technology that you and I don't even know about is being created in you know a lab somewhere in California? Now you have to make a huge, again, decision to sort of break away from what you're using. And so I really think more of this kind of boutique hub spoke model where it's a best of breed for now, and then having the flexibility for that to evolve over time is probably a winning strategy. Yeah, no, it's it's really, really interesting. And if you don't mind, I'd I'd like to pivot more to like the manager side. Um sure. You no, know, you're you're not you're not in the business of um, you know, managing money, but you have a unique seat because you see a lot of different managers. Uh you hear a lot of their stories, you talk to a lot of advisors who have experience with these managers. Um, again, a lot of the managers you curate have unique and, and more active strategies. Are you hearing from them with this boom and kind of active ETFs launching? Are you hearing rumblings that they're thinking about going to market with product um, and get out there on a more public basis? Yes. So you're kind of expanding on that, what are some of the reasons they're kind of giving you for wanting to make that leap? I mean, I can speak from my perspective, but it'd be interesting to hear what you're hearing from your side of the table as to why they think it's a good idea to take that jump. Um, I think if I had to simplify it, the motivation to do it is, is distribution and revenue, right? Like, let's not sugarcoat it. They see an opportunity where they say, man, I've got this SMA business. It's good. And if I can just get it into an ETF, think about all the wonderful things that are going to happen, right? Like in, in theory, you can increase your fee. Um, you can certainly increase your distribution once you hit scale. Uh, it's a lot easier to purchase an ETF than it is an SMA. It's, it's obviously, you know, trading is, is much more tax efficient. So there's a lot of benefits, right? I get it. But the mistake that I think they are making, and we try to talk them out of this, is don't be in such a hurry to launch an ETF and forget kind of your core business because our thesis is maybe the opposite, which is let's, let's help you launch your SMA business. Let's prove that concept that there is actual demand for your product. People like it. And then let them use it for two to three years. Let's go raise a few hundred million bucks on your strategy. Then... Let's go to the very people that are using it and saying, hey, you've got a $25 million allocation to, to the SMA and half of that's in non-qualified business. If we launch an ETF, would you be interested in converting that? And so now all of a sudden you could, you could see where you could get an ETF to you know, $100 million overnight versus a lot of them that launch because the, the, the firm thinks they have a good idea, but they don't show up on any screens, right? They don't have the assets. They don't have the history. They don't have any of it. So we think taking the opposite approach is, yes, you're right. Better distribution, more tax efficiency, higher revenue to the firm, easier to access. Like those are those are all you know knowns. Um, but getting demand first, building that asset base, and then launching it, we think is a much more effective strategy. Yeah, and that's that's really interesting because I've talked with a handful of. Um, kind of white label ETF partners on here, and they they kind of share they share a similar sentiment. Obviously, they want to build and, and get as many ETFs out there as they can. It's the core revenue of their business. But the old adage, "If you build it, they will come," is is not true in the ETF space. Um, so, with the rise in ETFs and the rise of of active, I mean, we've seen so many active listings this year. 
Do you see your TAMP business evolving in some way to help these managers trade and execute strategies over time? I mean, if you have managers on your platform that want to, that have, have kind of met the threshold to launch, is that something you could see your business evolving, not evolving into, but as an ancillary service? Yes. So um, UX today uh, trades for an ETF. Um, and so we offer that as a service. And then with our with the, the relationship that UX maintains with Thor as, as kind of a core manager, um, we run into this all the time. And, and Thor certainly owns its own series trust, which was a big decision that that firm made at the time, just for you know reasons that everybody would probably know. Um, and so it's, an, it's a situation where now we have the ability and infrastructure to do what you, you and I just talked about, which is this idea of Hey, you've got a great strategy or a suite of strategies. Let's identify the top one or two that are highly effective and cast a very wide net. Um, you know, sometimes they get way too. Um, some of these ETFs are so niche that you know they, they don't have mass appeal. And so once we identify one or two of those, we'll go. And once we hit a you know two hundred fifty, three hundred million dollar threshold, then it starts to make sense to have a conversation with. Okay, we have the series trust. Do you have interest in launching an ETF? And then we walk them through kind of what that process uh, and what the economics look like. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that makes makes a ton of sense, especially since you kind of have a pipeline to be able to do so. And so do you see a world um, where you have, again, unique strategies on the platform that do different things and have different objectives? Uh, currently, advisors, I would assume, have the ability to kind of blend these models together. Um, do you see a, a world um, where, and I'm, I'm a big believer of this, a rising tide lifts all ships or boats or what, however they want to call it. Uh, but do you see a world where you could kind of combine some of your best in class managers together to create uh, a single ETF, utilizing you know them as different sub advisors to create a really interesting kind of single solution uh, that could help for I don't know smaller accounts or help for, as we, as you said earlier, kind of smaller non or even non-qualified accounts that maybe you get four or five different managers that have very unique strategies and create one fund and, and they all kind of share in the, share in the growth and share in the revenue. So um, the short answer is yes. In fact, uh, we are partnering with the University of Texas um, to do exactly what you just sort of laid out, which is We've got some very, very good and effective managers on our platform. But as I always say, no one's got a monopoly on best ideas. Uh, there's no single strategy that's perfect that works all the time in all markets. And so we love the idea of, of blending models. Um, you know, it, it, no different than if you and I owned a, a, you know, since you were picking on my Broncos, let's say we were blessed and today we are now the owners of the Denver Broncos. <clears throat> we wouldn't go out and draft 11 quarterbacks. Like, you need a diversified lineup of, of players to be effective. And you have to think about where do you allocate your, you know, your draft capital and how do you spend your salary cap and all that stuff. We, so we're partnering with the University of Texas and their quantitative finance department, really taking a page in some ways out of DFA's playbook where we're going to go very academic, but instead of a DFA sort of strategic uh, buy and hold bias towards, you know, value and, uh, all the ways that they manage money, it's going to be, how can we blend in a single model, various managers that all complement one another that over time really smooth out that return um, for the client. So yes, that is something that we are doing. Uh, we're actually launching our first kind of model of models under that category um, in the fourth quarter of 23. And then we're doing uh, an advisor event in February at the University of Texas. Oh, that I mean, it's interesting. It makes sense. Like if you have, if you have the audience and you have the data and you have the manager, it, it makes sense, um, you know, to either utilize academics or in some ways, you know, quantitative or technology to be able to blend them together to get the best outcome. And I'm sure that that you know the allocation is to those kind of emulate kind of evolve over time. And so it could even be an active fund of funds or an active manager of managers, right? Yeah. Um, but with that being said, kind of kind of last question here. Um, what do you think a model? What do you think a, a model manager um, or an ETF provider needs to do 
in order to position themselves in the best possible position to get their models utilized. I mean, there's a lot of people in the space. There's a lot of ETFs that are launching. Um, you know, what have you seen managers do to put themselves out there in a way that's effective and that gets some traction other than just obviously pure performance? But as you and I probably both know, that just investing based on pure performance is going to bite you eventually. Um, so really, what do you think they're doing out there that, that separates them and allows them to gain scale? Well, I think it's important to understand, <clears throat> first and foremost, who you're competing against. I mean, you're not going to outspend um, or outhire the traditional names, right? Like the Black Rocks of the world, the Vanguards of the world, the others of the world. There's, they have an army of distribution. And so with unlimited resources. So you, you have to sort of know that going in. So I think you have to make sure that, A, you're doing something that you're solving a new problem and, and, and be very clear in what it is that you're specifically solving for. Um, and I think that in, in solving that, you need to, again, cast a wide net. It's got to it's gotta be something that has sort of mass appeal um, would be. And then I think once you, so you identify what you're solving, I think you need to very clearly articulate. Uh, you have a clear and concise message because you're not going to have a lot of time to get it in front of folks. Um, and, and then from there, I think you need to do what you say you're going to do. You have to consistently deliver on whatever that value proposition is um, because you're not a known commodity. And so I think if you find a, a, a space that needs improvement, you know, take you guys as an example on the Thor side, um, the low vol space has not been thought about for a long time. And, and, and the ETFs that exist, when you actually deconstruct them, I would argue they're not really low vol. They're just a, a factor-based ETF. So you guys have a very unique thought and approach to it. You do what you say you're going to do, um, and you clearly articulate it. And so that would be my advice um, to these managers. Well, Kyle, I, uh, I always appreciate our time together. And uh, thank you for joining me. But before I let you go... I'm not going to I'm not going to hate on the Broncos again, but where can people learn more about UX Wealth Partners and some of the services you provide? Our website is uh, uxwp.com. Um most information that you would need is is there and uh, you can certainly reach out to me or anyone on the TV of the website. We'd be happy to answer any questions we can. Well, again, Kyle, thank you for joining me and hope to catch up with you soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me.